we thank you for giving us the opportunity to study the Psalms. Mm. May we learn how to pray with those who have gone before us. David, the Jewish church, Jesus, the Christian church. Teach us to sing the songs that Christ sang. Amen. All right, so is it going to be? Yeah. Lisa, one second. Okay. Right. So uh, today we're looking at the Psalms as a guide to life community. If you were here last week, you know that honesty was the topic. And they kind of all flow together. But so I wanted to begin. I'm a poet. I'll just go ahead and I, I go ahead and apologize. I'm an English teacher. So I'm gonna refer to poetry, but it's just it's just what I do. My husband's an English teacher too, so you know, we have all these little inside jokes and we, you know, quote T S L all the time just for fun. Um, we do we do watch it like a good basketball game every now and then. But um, I immediately followed one of my favorite quotes by T. S. Eliot. And and Eliot says, What life have you if you have not life together? There is no life that is not in community, and no community that's not lived in the praise of God. I like that. It's from Courses from the Rock, which is not a well-known poem. I don't even think it's his best, but that's a nugget that I really like. So let's let's think about that. There you have the quote up there. So there's no life that's not in community. And um, along those lines, the writer of the book that we're studying, David Taylor, says, the next slide, uh, it's uh, the Psalter. Again, the Psalter is just a collection of songs. It's fundamentally a communal book where individuals find their place in the world of faithfulness and faithlessness within the co context of community. So it's a community book. So we're going to try to figure out how do we as individuals fit in to this community and as, we're, as we're reading the Psalms. And the psalmist, there's no way that the psalmist saw himself as an individual apart from Israel. So too often I think that, that we sit down and we think it's just me and the psalm. You know, sometimes it is, but we need to see it as a larger part. And the psalmist's whole identity was bound up in participation in the community of faith. So we're going to look at the individual and community. How do we fit in to that community? So, again, there's no autonomous spirituality, but our faith really needs to be lived in the company of God's people. I mean, how much you heard people say, well, I'm spiritual, I just don't go to church, or I have my own thing, um, I even have, well, a friend who's, his challenge is to go to church on Sunday and have no one speak to him. Okay, it's a little different. He's like, that's the kind of church I'm looking for. Yes, he's an introvert, but that, for me, the opposite would be, I would rule out a church where no one spoke to me. But that I'll hold to the community. So I guess for him, his spirituality is just it's autonomous. It's, it's, about, it's about him. It needs to be lived in the community of God's people. And in that, we share the good and the bad, right? We, um, we share our praises, we share our struggles, we share our um, successes, our failures, we share our happiness together and our sadness. And so last week, if you remember, Megan was talking about the tendency to hide and, and how high it, we, we think we're going to hide from God and we want to hide from each other too. And another thing, Bonhoeffer, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, but most of you are probably familiar with him. He wrote, and I found this interesting, he says, the pious fellowship permits no one to be a sinner. You're not allowed to be a sinner in a pious fellowship, okay? So what does that mean? Well, we got to hide our sin then if we're in a pious fellowship and act like um, we're doing okay. 
And he says, we dare not be sinners. I like the word dare to use. But how would we, and some of you might have been in a fellowship like that before. I don't think we're having it like that at all. I think it's, it's really good. And I would also add that we dare not be broken. You know, we have to, we have this tendency to think everybody has it all together. Maybe you've not thought that, but I have. <laughs> and I know I remember um, I spent a year studying at Regent College in Vancouver. And I went because I felt like there was some block between God and me. And I've been a Christian for a long time, but but something just wasn't there. And I felt kind of empty and kind of broken. And I think I, I had rode with friends part of the way, and I remember I cried all the way from Durham, North Carolina to Asheville. Okay. <laughs> I thought I was in for an adventure. Um, and I was excited because I really knew God would meet me there, but I still felt broken. So but while we're there, we we're all in community groups, and our, it was our group's time to do chapel, and everybody in the group said, there's like, well, who's going to speak? And they all go, Mary Beth is going to speak at chapel. Yeah, you have to do it. You have to do it. And so I was speaking at chapel, and I gave my testimony, and I kind of talked about just, I had that spiritual dryness I had, and that lack of fulfillment, a lack of joy, and how I felt like I had eaten from the banquet life, but still didn't feel nourished. So I shared all of that, and my immediate thought is, well, I might not have any friends on here. Well, I just shared, and I'm like, whoa, what a loser. Okay, sorry, I still remember all the high school stuff. Okay. Um, uh, this is a different audience. So that's what I felt like. But the opposite happened. People came up to me afterwards, and people said, like, hey, thanks for sharing that. I felt like that, too. I've come here and I'm, you know, someone will say, I'm, I'm a doctor in real life around this, but here I'm not. That's my identity. So um, I was surprised by that. Instead of closing the door, it actually opened the door. And people felt more comfortable. I think they saw their pain in my pain, their brokenness in my brokenness. And together, you can heal as a community. Even one guy, wanted to go out to lunch and I found out pretty soon in the lunch that he had some major psychological issues. I, mean, I think he was paranoid and I realized that he's not the kind of person that people are just going to want to be around. So maybe he felt like I can take a chance maybe this person won't reject me because this person has, I'm not paranoid yet, but, but this person has shown vulnerability. So he just felt this openness. And I attribute it all to God, but I just thought for so long in my life, I had to have this image of, I've got it together. I'm okay. I'm not, I, can't, I can't let people see what's really inside me. And that hiding is just not good for community. It's not good for us individually. It's not good for, for the community. So the community, a good community, will help us be, as the title of our book, open and unafraid, as Taylor says. So as we look at Psalm 22 together, we can, we can see that the speaker is voicing both deep pain and suffering, as well as joy. And it's his, and it's ours. Well, and it's Christ, too. So let's look at Psalm 22 together. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? This is one we all know. Um, it is, keep in mind that it is a messianic psalm, messianic nature of the psalm. So it's, uh, and, and Malcolm, guiding notes. Is this better? Okay. Malcolm Guy notes, he said, it was on the lips of Jesus as he died. That gives him, it gives this psalm a special power and a real poignancy. Jesus prayed this. 
And as such, the psalm is going to give others, as well as us, a glimpse of Christ's inner life, Christ's prayer life. Um, but it also speaks to the power of life in the community of faith. So keep in mind, David, they attribute this to David. David prays this. Jesus prays it. We pray it. The congregation prays it. So if you look at it in that way, we'll go back to the first four verses, the first five verses. Okay. Great. So um, the Psalms are poetry, so we're going to look at it as poetry, too. They're not meant to be sermons. They're not meant to be theological treatises. So we're going to look at it as a prayer, and it's poetry. So things to keep in mind when you're looking at poetry, as this is, um, you want to keep in mind the speaker. Who's, who's talking? Is there one voice? Are there two voices? Who's talking? And what is the tone of it? Does it shift? Are there shifts throughout it? You usually can tell there's a shift when there's a word like but or yet, something like that. And um, only pay attention to the, um, the pronouns, too. You're going to find that he moves from I, he says you a lot, and then they. And I think that's, that's important, too. And in poetry, something I always would tell my students to do is look for words that are repeated. And you're going to find words that are repeated here because they're usually important. Think of all the words you could choose. And a poet is limiting the number of words. Think of um, patterns. I think Megan already talked about that, the parallelism, the imagery. What, what does that suggest? And I'll point out some of those. Contrast, metaphors, all those things were part of this. So hopefully we can appreciate that together. So we look at the first part. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh, my God, I cry by day and you do not answer, and by night, but I find no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel, in you our fathers trusted. They trusted, and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. So can you see the shift that's taken place even um, in those... Uh, the first two verses for, for the last one. Um, and look at all the yous. Definitely speaking to God. You. You. Um, do you see another word that, that seems important that's repeated? Especially in 3 through 5. Trust. Trust. I think it's important. You just and, and that repetition is important. So if you look, you know, in you are fathers trusted, they trusted, they trusted, and were not put to shame. So what's important is there's a remembrance of God's nature. I mean, this speaker. more that he knows, right? With, you know, Holy Spirit involved. In You're feeling beat down. But what happens? And, the, you know, this is how he's feeling. I cry by day and you don't answer. Yet you are holy. And so there's a remembrance of God's nature. God is holy. Uh, God is holy, and um, he's seen deliverance in the past. Sorry, there's something going on here. He's seen deliverance in the past. I don't know if you've ever prayed like the first two verses. Have you ever felt like God was far off? I think that's how I felt when I was headed to Vancouver for that year. I just felt like, God, why are you so far off? I feel like you're not answering me. You ever had those restless nights? 
Eugene Peterson translates in the message, he says, tossing and turning. Don't you hate those nights? When they happen, they happen. And he's not at rest. What he remembers, they weren't put to shame. So that's important. They weren't put to shame. But let's look at the next ones. Unlike the speaker of the poem who feels like he's been put to shame. So look at, um, I want to hop up there. That's so why, because when I teach, I just get up there. You know, we mark it up, go to the board, but I just can't do that. But um, so look at the speaker's current state. You know, is there anybody among us who can't put herself in the speaker's position? I'm a worm and not a man. Okay, that would be a good metaphor there. I don't know about you, but I've, I've never said, oh, man, I'm just feeling so wormy today. <laughs> but you fell low. And worms, they're kind of gross, right? We've had this epidemic of worms out in the mountains, and they're nasty. Somehow they find their way inside. It's like, what are all these worms doing? There's some worms. To feel like a worm, that's pretty low. Like, nobody notices. Nobody notices. Nobody notices. He's scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. What are they doing? Da, da, da. Um, Recording in progress. Dumbass. Feeling wormy. All who see me mock me. Oh, you think he's exaggerating there? A little hyperbole. Everybody. If you've had children, they probably they come home and exaggerate. It's like, nobody was my friend today or something like that. All, all who city mocked me. Um, I'm despised by the people. Well, okay. He's scorned by mankind, all of mankind. This reminds me of a side by Shakespeare. Because, again, we felt like this. Shakespeare says, when in disgrace with fortune and men's eyes, I all alone beweep my outcast state and trouble death heaven with my bootless cries and look upon myself and curse my fate. Well, it's the kind of same thing. Bootless cry, I'm crying out to God. I don't feel like God's listening. I don't feel like God's hearing I remember my little niece when she was going through it. Um, I guess a little slightly rebellious thing when she was about two. She was trying to explain something to my brother and his wife, and she goes, Are you hearing me? I'm like, oh, that's a little cheeky. Like, are you hearing me? Don't we feel like that sometimes to God? God, are you hearing me? I've been saying this over and over again. So we feel this. Um, note again the repetition of the word trust. He, he, this time he says, oh, they're mocking me. They're going to say, he trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. Yet you are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust you at my mother's breast. On you was I cast from my birth. And from my mother's womb, you have been my God. Let's look at the imagery and how it contrasts. Look at the part when he says, you, you are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust you at my mother's breast. On you I was cast from birth. And from my mother's womb, you have been my God. That's paternal imagery, isn't it? The womb is a safe place. 
But it's okay. He who took you out of the womb holds you. It reminds me of that hymn, that old hymn, Safe in the Arms of Jesus. You know, pulled from the womb, safe. So that's a nice image. You made me trust you, my mother's breast. So again, it just kind of repeats that again in the last one, you have been my God. You know, he's, he's trusted God from the time he was an infant, basically. And the important thing he does here is he remembers, you have been my God. And you know, those times when we are feeling the same way too, like we, we're alone, or we've been cut off, life isn't going so well. If we can look back and remember the times and say, you have been my God, you have been my God. And that's what's going on there. And so then we go on to the next the next slide. As he prays, be not far from me. You have been my God. Be not far from me. For trouble is near and there is none to help. The message translates that I need a neighbor. Isn't that great? I need a neighbor. We all need neighbors. Tom and I were so happy when we got new next door neighbors until they built a pool and a fence. It's a big privacy fence. And you know, there's a Robert Frost poem where one of the speakers says, good fences make good neighbors. But it's said ironically. Do they really? What are you walling in and walling out? Well, that's that. On the other side, there's a creek. And what I thought was an empty house until some dog food showed up in our house, a huge box with a name on it. It wasn't our name. We only have a stuffed golden retriever because I won't let my husband have a real one. So it wasn't <laughs> for us. I finally figured out, I tried to drive around and see the, the, um, the numbers on the mailbox. So I finally figured, well, let me see if I can find a phone number for this lady. And I called her up. Turned out she lived in a house that we thought was vacant. It's on the other side of the creek. Thought no one lived there. We didn't see signs of life or anything. So anyway, I ended up taking the dog food over to her. And um, she thanked me. And she said she lived in that house since she was 10 years old. And she said, all my family is in heaven. All my family's in heaven. And I thought, wow, she needed a neighbor. She needed a neighbor. And I said, we're retired. Call us anytime if you need, if you need help. And she took me up on that. But later, out of the blue, I was the eye doctor. I got a call from her. And she goes, you said that I could call you, and I have no one else to call. And it went do I had to what was left alone. So she asked if I could take the dog to the vet. I didn't know what's gonna be this big stubborn dog. We fought over get the dog in the car and stuff. But she needed a neighbor. So I just stuck in, in my mind. Of, sometimes I don't realize that other people could be so alone. And um, it still looks like no one lives here. I need to take a meal or something. Now, we just looked at that maternal imagery, which felt safe and protected. And look at this, where he says, be not far from me. Many bulls encompass me, strong bulls of the shine surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like a brave threatening and roaring lion. Aren't those different images from being protected from the womb, cared for? This is different. There's, he's longing for the closeness of the previous, that we see in the previous verses. So this is strong, violent dangerous animal imagery. I'm poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. They ever felt poured out like water? 
Aí eu tenho nothing in the glass, all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. So this is what a poet does. The heart is like wax. Well, it's a prayer request and 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 their praises. You know, it's a, we're calling out to God, would you pray for so and so? Would you pray for for this? But then their praises, and isn't that encouraging when we hear this is what God has done? God's done this in the past. That encourages my heart. I know it does. So the same God who did that is going to continue to do it. So that's, that's the beauty of the corporate worship, the community. And all offspring, too. So it's expanded. Everybody will stand in awe. And in the message, uh, Peterson said, here's a story I'll tell my friends when they come to worship and punctuate it with hallelujahs. You know, what, what's your story to share in the congregation? What's my story? You know, what's God done in your life that you want to share with people? Maybe God took you from this a place where the speaker of the poem was in. It took you out of it because you know the character of God. The God who you thought was far off all along turned out to be right there with you, always with you. That's what I think we forget sometimes. And then he continues. The NIV uses the expression, the theme of my praise. So I like that. You know, there's usually a theme of his praise. So he says, from you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I'll perform before those who fear him. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations shall worship before you. For kingship belongs to the Lord. He rules over the nations. And that mean? You just think of the future generations. Here we are praying the Psalms. You think back to Israel and just the use of the Psalms. And in a lot of churches, I know the Church of England is a part of their, their worship service to go through the cycle of the Psalms. And it's always a good reminder. And we're, just, you know, we're studying the different types of Psalms here. But you know, again, the importance of remembering what God has done. I mean, I think, look at us sitting here in this nice room. Remember what God did through the Sunshine Campaign. God worked in our church. And, um, and we thank God for that. So in verse 29, all the prosperous of the earth eat and worship. Before him shall bow all who go down to the dust, even the one who could not keep himself alive. Posterity shall serve him. It shall be told of the Lord to the coming generation. They shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn, that he has done it. Okay, I like that, the idea of a people yet unborn. You might have grandchildren that are unborn right now or know someone who's expecting a baby. I always like when they put the roses in church. We're going to proclaim God's righteousness to, to the babies. And people who are unborn still will do it. Look what God has done. So you know what happens when we come together as a community? We encourage each other. It's mutual encouragement and acceptance. I mean, if it's, if it's a healthy community, acceptance. You know, not the pious community where you can't be a sinner, you can't be broken. And the whole idea that I'm not alone. God sets the lonely in families. The speaker feels so alone in the song early on. And we feel like I'm a part of the community. I like saying that. 
I'm a part of the North Avenue Women's Bible Study. You know, to be a part of something. It's a great group of women. Um, and we're part of the story. And it's a greater story. You know, to, we just see ourselves as part of that, that big story. Again, a literary illusion. But um, the Lord of the Rings, Sam says, you probably heard this before, he goes, don't the great stories never end? And Frodo goes, no, they never end as tales. But the people in them come and go when their parts are ended. So we're part of a story that began long ago, started long ago, and it continues. You know, the God who listened to David's heart, the heart that felt like wax, will listen to our hearts and to our cries. Let's, um, I want you to hear, if you've got your, oh, I don't think you have Malcolm's poem. Or, um, you know, as Megan told us that the, the course we took this summer, Malcolm guy wrote a, a, a poem to go with each song. And so I thought we would have him reading it today since he can't actually be here. And so we if you can look and follow along, uh, whatever works best for you, listening or all. But he, something he said was to look for, how do you put it, oh, nuggets that feed the soul. I don't like that. Like even if poetry is your thing, there are always little nuggets you can pull out. I mean, I can think of, of certain books where I didn't like the book, but I found like one nugget something valuable, I thought, that's good. So, so listen to that, because I'm going to ask you when we finish, um, if you found a nugget that would feed your soul. So let's listen to Malcolm read this. All the scorns with which we blaspheme God and one another are concentrated here among the horns of unicorns, the lion's mouths, and the slather of our devouring wickedness. So the idea of blaspheming God in one another, it was interesting to me. Kind of like when we... Yeah. Oh, we like one another, or we put one another down, or whatever we do, it's like you know, we're, I'm doing it to God, or and what is it the way we act sometimes? I don't think we'd want to acknowledge that that we could blaspheme God and one another. But the image that we take, even that, and turns it into life. Good, yes. Even that, or devouring wickedness. Someone might have said this, that he gathers all of us. I like that too. That's just a gathering. And then, of course, you know, for Christ himself is crying through the psalm. And, and you know, Malcolm wants to remind us that Christ is through this whole psalm. We have the privilege of saying that in our prayer life of Christ, he's crying through the song. I tremble at the mystery. It's interesting that we use the word God because that's one of the words that song was repeated early on. What word did you say? Uh, uh, Good, good. I like that observation. Mary Beth, we can't see you because the papers are in front of the camera. There you go. There's a learning curve on this. Um, no mocking. <laughs> so I'll read one last 
couple of quotes. This is from Bonhoeffer in Life Together. God has prepared for himself one great song of praise throughout eternity. And those who enter the community of God join in this song. It's a song that the morning stars sang together, all the sons of God shouted for joy at the creation of the world. It's the victory song of the children of Israel after passing through the Red Sea, the Magnificent of Mary after the Annunciation, the song of Paul, Paul and Silas in the night of the prison, the song of the singers on the sea of glass after their rescue, the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. It's a song of the heavenly fellowship. I just love that idea of one great song of praise. And something that Taylor mentions in his book is what are the songs that Christ sings? And we saw this in Psalm 22. He sings the songs of all families. Remember how they include the word all families in there? He sings the song of those in a place of abundance the one who's feasting at the table, and the song of the poor, those who are afflicted, the song of generations past, and the song of generations yet to come. Jesus sings, sings these songs in the midst of the congregation, and we are invited to be a part of this community of worship. Come join in the song. Any comments or anything before we break into small groups? Not, um, questions in this book? There are a lot of them, but if you agree, there might be just a couple you want to focus on. They're, they're good questions to think about. You know, what what makes it so easy to hide from our community? And what dynamics in society make it easier for us to hide from our community? And then what might help us not hide from our community? And then he mentions, how does our culture think about the relationship between me and us, I and our, I and y'all? <laughs> Circling back to your very first story, um, you know, reading this, it just seems so personal. It's a that, you know, teacher is That's good. There's a rich Sorry. Something, something, something they sound To the richness of it. Right. What life have you if you have not life together? There is no life that is not in community, and no community not lived in the praise of God. Is back up on the screen. I think that where we need to be to make us separated with all the pandemic and the community. I need to be back together. Yes. I should have mentioned that just how the pandemic has, has really affected community. It's, it, it feels so good to, to see people again. What allows us to hide this, and it's kind of hard to come back. Yeah. But then, you know, there's the new barrier. You know, it needs to be at all. Um, no, but anyway, God knows. I, I, um, I've had so many things that's gone on in my life that fear does not. Thank you.
let's go into our groups. I don't know how we're going to do it today. Um, you could just sit at the table where you are. Yeah. Was there a group form last week? Or? All right, thank you. Thank you.